Hey guys, Rob here from Room 301. Today I'm joined by John McRae, who's a content associate. Expect to learn why resilience is crucial in marketing, especially in the face of failures, and why words have significant power and should be chosen carefully. Let's get into it. Good afternoon, John. How are you? I'm good, thank you, buddy. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, first thing I want to cover, John, is really tell us about you. Tell us about how you got into marketing, first of all. Sure. Um, so I've been in marketing for about five years now. Um, I think like most marketers had a bit of an unconventional route into it. Um, I used to be a content editor for the financial services um, wing of Reuters. Um, so I do kind of like long form writing or occasionally like distilling complex documents down into sort of like bite sized chunks really for financial services clients. And it was great. But I was doing a lot of editing and not a lot of original writing and creating. So I um, had a chat with somebody on LinkedIn and we went for a coffee. We spoke about the role that they, they had, which was a content marketing position. And basically she was like, you can write, I can teach you how to do marketing. And I was kind of like, cool, let, let's do it. Let's go for that. That sounds great. Um, and there my journey began really um i've since worked in a bunch of SaaS roles mm. experienced the uh, delights of back-to-back -back redundancies along the way um Come on, the covid <laughs> yeah, it was pretty rough um and now i'm at a company called bohurst uh, which is based in uh, nottingham and brixton uh basically we're a private um company database um provider and pretty much any UK company, um, we've got the data on it, what they're doing, what industry they're in, where they're based, who the key stakeholders are, uh, and I work in marketing for, for them. Excellent. And what's your day to day there? What's your sort of role at Bohurst? So I'm a content associate. So pretty much all of the content that you see coming out will be from myself or you, yeah. um, my other colleague. Um, I'm one of two content associates. So we do a lot of blog writing, uh, we're moving into webinars a lot recently. All of like the full mix marketing stuff, so the email comms, the social comms, uh, and so on and so forth. Awesome. Well, look, as everyone will know by this point, we sort of cut the podcast into to three different areas. The first one is called What's in Your Toolbox, which is where we really we ask marketing leaders what's in their toolbox. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a software tool, although it, it certainly can be. I also like to hear about sort of frameworks, the ways, you know, people like to think about their workload. You know, marketers are very, very busy. So, you know, how you approach your workload, how you get things done, how you stick to deadlines, so on and so forth. Once we've done that, we move into what's called a funny failure. And the reason I do this is because I like to hear something funny, first of all. But second of all, I think the best way to learn, the best way to improve is, is by failing. It's by doing stuff wrong, making mistakes. Um, and understanding what you can take from that in order to apply something different the next time you go about it. And then finally, the sort of main event is Room 301. So Room 301 is a room where we put everything we no longer want to see in marketing ever again. We, we stick them in there, never to be seen again. So start us off, John. Tell us what's in your toolbox. Tell us how you approach your work. Tell us what tools you use to help you be more efficient. I'm, I'm a nerd about this stuff. Love to hear it. So yeah, over to you. So I think I'll probably recommend a couple of software tools that everybody already knows and uses if you're in marketing, digital Go marketing it, or otherwise. Yeah. Um, and then something a little bit outside the box. So ChatGPT, obvious, everyone uses it. It's, well, I say everyone uses it, actually. Um, there was a report the other day that came out that said that people don't use it that, that often. Okay. Um, well, I'm, but I'm it's, one just, of the it's spoken about a lot. <laughs> Are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I use it for very specific uses. Um, as a content writer, there's obviously like a lot of friction between, you know, content writing and sort of mm. artificially created content that like, creates a lot of anxiety, I think, for content sure. people, justifiably. Um, I use it for different reasons. I don't use it for, for copy. Um, I'm a pretty good prompter, but I just don't think the copy that comes out of it is very good. And I think that just comes from just years of being a writer. 
Um, but what I do use it for is for ideation. Yes. Uh, I look. I also look at gaps in the content, both the content that I'm writing at the moment, um, almost as a sort of like a BS alarm. Like, what are you missing from this? What's the mm. key thing that like maybe you've not thought about? Um, and I think it's really, really good for that. Um, also for like content strategy, um, I am one of those like just invariably scatty content writers who has all sorts of ideas, but I need a framework to put it down and I need to think about the reasoning behind what I'm doing. Who's it for? What's it trying to achieve? Because you don't want to like run head on into content production because ultimately it just ends up a mess. You need to really think about who you're speaking to, what it's achieving. Um, so I think the great thing about large language models, whether it's ChatGPT or Claude or, or any of the others is it's very concise. It can just, you ask it something really, you know, complex and can distill it down into the basics for you, which I find yeah. really good for just kind of like gathering my thoughts, you know? hundred percent. I think that's a really good way to use it as well. I know our team, particularly in the SEO team here at the Digital Maze, um, anybody involved in copywriting, how you explained how you use ChatGPT is exactly how we would do it. It's obviously very dangerous to take content in big blocks and plonk it on a website. We all, we all know that. But to identify content gaps, ideation, it's brilliant. Me, me personally, you won't relate to this, John, because you're obviously great at writing content. I am not one of those people. I use it in, in ways, you know, for example, when I'm, you know, leading a company, you obviously have to communicate things internally quite a lot. And, and I think sometimes one of the things I'm not fantastic or hands up is, is getting the tone right in those messages. So sometimes I'll write a message, I'll get the point I want to put across in there. You know, maybe it's a company announcement or a change to a process, whatever it might be. But I asked Chet G G GPT to sort of give me thoughts on the tone. How, how might this be received by different people? And then, I, you know, I ask it to do a different iteration of that until it gets to the point where it's it's got a nice balance between delivering a message, but also considering how it might be met by different people. And that's really quite good for me who's someone who's not fantastic at, um, at writing. And I, I can use that in emails as well sometimes. So yeah, it's definitely good to have, it's like having somebody with you, just look over your shoulder and go, I'm not sure about that, Rob. <laughs> no, that, that that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good use case actually. Cause it also like, I think when you use it for content writing, whether it's short yeah. internal content like that or, you know, or external, it's thinking, it makes you think about what you're producing, what you're writing, like you said, how it might be received. That's really important for stuff like yeah. that. So the funny thing is, that, again, I, used to having run, that... I used to run messages like that by my wife. I used to go, just check, <laughs> just check this. I don't want to come across like, you know, but now that, you know, AI is now my wife. <laughs> Put that as the tagline for this one. Yeah, Perfect. there we go. <laughs> um, uh, next, next, what's in your toolbox next then, John? Um... I also have a couple of books. Uh, something I neglected to mention in my intro is I am a book blogger. Um, so I, yeah, when I'm not um, rearing two very, very small children and working full time, um, I do on occasion uh, partake in, in uh, a lot of reading, obviously, and a lot of critical reviews. So I have got a couple of books to recommend. Um, one is Write It All Down by Kathy Renison Brink. And basically, the reason I recommend this is, although it's a book that's aimed at pe helping people write memoir, which is something I'm looking at at the moment, it's actually just really good for writers in general, in terms of like getting your thoughts out on the page. Yeah. Uh, something she talks about in it a lot is tolerating the terror of the blank page, which I think any copywriter, content marketer, can probably attest to. You start on a project, You've got that blank page. What do you do with it? And how do you get past that mental block of knowing that invariably the first draft of literally anything you produce will be garbage and it just well, moves yeah. refining? That, that's everything, isn't it? Not just, that's yeah. not just yeah, um, to, for copyright, I guess. That is any project starts with a blank page and that comes with a lot of anxiety and what's next? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. But it's, it's a big mental block sometimes for people. Um, so, yeah, I find it really, really useful for that, for both creative writing and, and for marketing. Excellent. Is that is that is that an, is that a new book? Is that, is that something that's been around quite a while? Uh, I think it's I think it's a few years old. Um, 
20... It's one that I think will stand the test of time, though. It feels like it's a Oh, framework. absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I emailed the author, I emailed Kathy, actually, after I read it, and was like, this is basically one of those books that's kind of changed my life. Yeah, so thank yeah, you, yeah. and got a pretty nice response. 2022. Oh, nice. It was quite recent, okay. actually. Quite recent. Um, I have another two, if we have time, I can be briefer with those. Go for it. Um, I'll blast through them. The second one, I don't have... Uh, a paper copy of, uh, I've got it on Kindle, is George Orwell's Politics and the English Language, which is a little bit left field, but yeah. actually any writer, whether they're a journalist, whether they're a politician, whether they're a copywriter, whether they're, whether they're just involved in communicating to people en masse should read that book. Like it should be recommended reading. I mean, it's, I say it's a book, it's about 26 pages. It's really an essay. Um, and kind of speaking to what you've just said about using chat GPT. That's, that's what's going through my mind now. Maybe yeah, I should read this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, honestly, it's worth a read. You can get it, you can get it, uh, on Amazon for free or very little, um, all good bookshops. There we go. Um, no, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, no bias here. <laughs> no. <laughs> good bookshops everywhere. Um, and basically, he deconstructs how politicians use language to justify things that, mm. you know, atrocities, for example, how language can be used to couch quite serious things in ordinary, everyday language. Um, it's obviously a very cynical book, but it's also really, really important for, again, thinking about what exactly are you saying? Like, you're writing words down but words have power, words have meaning. Make sure you're using the right ones because again, they'll be perceived in certain ways. Um, and it's got all sorts of like, just really great um, recommendations on, on yeah. things you should do, things you shouldn't do as a writer. Um, I think that's that's really, I mean, it's straight away, that's, that's something I've been reading, but I think certainly, certainly post COVID where a lot of companies are remote, the amount of leaders now that have to, you know, put something out, some sort of messaging. It's not always good news, of course. It's not always good news. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not good news. And there's definitely something to be said about how that, how words on a page are perceived by people now in a, in, a, in a company of all sizes. Whereas pre-COVID, that may have been spoken about. You might, you might have done that announcement in the office rather than written it down. And therefore the tone might be a little bit better. You can sense how, if it's positive, if it's negative, but words on a page are very different. People read them and receive them in all different ways. So I think that's a really interesting recommendation. Yeah, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's a good point with, you know, words down on you know, emails and things like that. Mm. You know, if people read something like a word, like restructuring is very loaded and people yes. immediately will go, oh, what does that mean? Or, uh, yeah, he, he sort of talks about words that are used that, have almost been t just people don't use anymore because of the connotations mm. associated with them. the blacklist, the blacklist um, of words <laughs> pretty much yeah yeah um and if we've got time for one more very briefly um i have um copywriting is by andrew bolton um you might know him he's, he's I've uh, heard, yeah i've heard he, this one yeah yeah he's, he's pretty prolific uh on linkedin he's a very very good copywriter and it's just like a really really funny book as well as being informative um i think one of the things i like about it is that it's not prescriptive like it's not like a quote-unquote business book hmm. like it's just a really really funny relatable and still educational piece of writing um for copywriters and to be fair marketers generally it's full of like quite amusing observations um about marketing departments and the perceptions of them within wider businesses. Hmm. Um, I think anybody anybody uh, who works in a marketing team will enjoy that. Awesome. And did you have one more one, one more in your toolbox? Am I right in saying that? Yes. Something um, more left, to be fair. Something more left field, I think you said. Well, to be fair, I thought the books might be left field purely because I know people don't necessarily recommend them as their tools. But for me, well, it's literally I, what I, I live know. and I mean, breathe in. A lot of my frameworks, a lot of the ways I think about getting through busy workloads and pressure and all all my coping mechanisms and working frameworks are from books 
everything I know is, is, is either from something I've failed at or, or reading books and stealing ideas from people who are much smarter than myself. And that's, that's why books are so good, isn't it, right? That's it. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. <laughs> um, I suppose as my other thing I would recommend, um, actually just to new content marketers or copywriters, is... Um, especially if you're coming from a background like I did where I was coming from a white paper writing background and then I really had to think about my words in a more sort of like Mm. um, digital friendly and commercial way is like just get used to search console early on like it will be your friend for a long long time Um, it's very simple you know it's not like an enterprise tool or anything obviously it's one that you, you know you get out the box with Google but it's such a great way to look at how's your content performing from an organic perspective and what kind of insights are you missing again and what you're, you're producing at the moment. I still use it every day. I've been doing this gig for yeah. five plus years. It's, it's a staple. Yeah. I know our team do as well. And I guess in terms of another use case for that, I guess you can use it to find, you know, where the gaps are as well. What sort of terminology are people using just because you've got a service or the way I would think about it, just because you've got a set of services and you're used to calling it a certain name, if somebody's trying to find that service and has a need for it, they they may call it or classify it something very different and your content needs to almost marry up with that, doesn't it, I suppose? And, and something like Search Console can help you do that marrying is, is, is one way I've always approached using Search Console. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's a really, 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 really important tool. I think it gets overlooked sometimes because uh, people, everybody knows analytics, um, yeah, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's great if you, mm. again, if you're getting into content marketing, get used yeah. to that no, straight away. I, I agree. It's been it's one of them ones that been around for so long, and it's had so many different. It's taken lots of different shapes and sizes, but it, it's remained a fundamental for as long as I can remember, going back probably 10, 15 years now. It's just it's just a constant. Our team have changed software tools I don't know how many times but the one that has remained constant is analytics and search console it just shows how good it is and how useful it is for the ones that knows who knows what they're doing so yeah I know I think they're really good recommendations particularly uh the books I really enjoyed that so once we get off the off the air John I'll be getting some Amazon links off you and that lapel mic of I need some of that I think as well um (laughs) I'll send you a link to the blog absolutely let's do it um failures I get a bit obsessed with failures in a strange way because I think a lot of the things that I know how to do and what I would, I guess, say I'm reasonably good at these days is because somewhere along the lines I have made a horrible, horrible mess of it. Um, And that's the only way you can learn. It's the only way you can pick up where you went wrong. Um, So yeah, one of the questions I always ask, I guess, is what's something you failed at that stuck with you and what did you learn from it? Bonus points if it's funny as well because everyone likes something funny. (laughs) Right, I reckon I can I can do not funny and I can do funny. Okay, one of each. So let's do both. Let's, do let's both. start with the not funny because then we can end on a high. Um, not funny is um, back-to-back redundancies, as I spoke no. about at the top of the episode. Um, I've never experienced that before. Um, and 2021 and then 2022, they pretty much just came like bosses. Um, they always seem to coincide as soon as we had a child as well, which was really, really bad. I was about timing. to say, and I did notice you, you mentioned about rearing two children. Uh, yeah, I, I've got a young yeah. child myself, so I can only imagine what sort of impact that had on you, and on a personal level as well. So, yeah, it, it definitely um, it sticks with you um, for sure. Um, you question yourself a lot. You, mm. There's a lot of introspection following stuff like that, whether it's you know whether you could have done much about it or not, mm. uh, you know, in those situations. And, and if you don't mind me asking... Them, just knackering businesses, yeah. really. And if you don't mind me asking them, you know, we're not going to name any any companies here, but what was the reason, was it financial strains on the businesses? You know, was it was it to do with, with that ultimately? Yeah, uh, the first one, the entire department, marketing department yeah. just folded. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting experience. Um None of us had actually met each other in person because it was during COVID, <laughs> but lockdown restrictions lifted about the time we all got our P45. So we um, we met up for a Nando's and commiserated together. And I can look up, look back on it in somewhat of a 
That's nice. um, <laughs> with a right with a wry smile. I got to meet yeah. them. They're, they're good, good people. Still in touch with them, but um, it was yeah. tough. Like it, 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 it was really, really tough. Um, and yeah, kind of the same with the other one. It's financial pressures, yeah. supply chain as much as anything. Supply chain sure. affecting the business. That has a knock on effect on how much sort of capital you've got. Um, to work with and you know in reality i don't think i could have done much about those things they're external no. factors but like i think what i did learn from that is you sort of have to become more resilient but you there's a certain point where you need to harden yourself to be more resilient but not harden yourself to the point where you kind of become defensive and closed minded mm. you have to think about try and take a top level view. And sometimes that just comes with time. That just comes with healing. That comes with uh, talking to people, um, you know, getting therapy as well, potentially, you know, sometimes you just need to take a step back um, and know the value that you bring and know that sometimes things happen like that. And it's really unpleasant, but you can learn from it in terms of, yeah, resilience, but don't harden your heart. You know, it's, these things happen and, what, and was on, on that point then was in a strange way was the second time it happened almost easier than the first one because you've been through the experience before you kind of knew the thoughts and yes and no would, would pass yeah and, you know, so on. yeah I, th I think so i mean obviously it happened like quite soon after because it was back to back so there was an element oh, of so here we go really back to back then yeah like really like yeah pretty oh, sort wow. of like few months kind of thing um but at the same time, that only happens, like you said, for the first time once. Mm, you only ever have it. that first time experience once. There's nature of it, 100%. so you do you do have that that benefit of of hindsight yeah. and perspective and, and 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 so on and so forth. So it definitely helped. I think. Yeah, I just learned a lot of myself about myself in that time. Mm. I couldn't have necessarily done anything about it, but I could still. Yeah think about how I react to adversity. And that's important just in day to day, you know, just the, the sort of ebbs and flows of business, right? You, you have some really bad days sometimes. Think, and it's about how you kind of just like draw a line under it and come back again. Yeah, the next day. I think people forget that, particularly in marketing related roles, there is a lot of there is, a, there is a lot of resilience required, in my opinion, because you can try 10 things and only nine of them, sorry, nine of them won't work. You're just looking for that one thing that works and you kind of double down on that. But it takes a certain level of resilience to, to, you know, see that nine of the things that you worked so hard at doing didn't work. But you get the benefit of that one thing that really does work. Um, That's the spark as well, can, isn't it? And it yeah, and it yeah. can take months to find the one thing. You can spend six months just constantly, why is this not working? Why is this not working? Light bulb moment. So, yeah, and you, you do need resilience. It's not always... Pressure doesn't always come in the form of pounds, pence, and revenue and profitability. It comes in other forms as well. And I think it's easy to forget that in marketing roles, definitely. 100%. Um, and to That's lighten right. the mood. I was going to say, the on a high. <laughs> the scent on a high. Yeah, no, I've got a... Um, this was long before I was in marketing. I was but a teenager. Uh, my first ever role was... Um, I volunteered at Bernardo's. I did quite a few volunteering jobs when I was a teenager prior to getting my first role and I was volunteer on the shop floor and first day walk in super anxious like I'm naturally quite an anxious person anyway but like this was just like intense because you're just sort of like front of shop people coming in asking you questions everyone who's done it for the first time knows knows what it's like and like I was wanting to pay so much attention to make sure I did absolutely everything right that I was just like almost like not listening. I was like super jacked in, just making sure that I didn't do something stupid, so I did something stupid. And like, you know, the lesson learned there is just listen, um, like, and take a step back again, take a deep breath. And basically, they took me around the tour of the shop and they were like, you know, this is the back room, this is where we store everything. This is the kitchen, this is where you can grab a cup of tea. This is X, this is Y. This is the bin area where we put everything out. And I was just like, okay, cool, yeah, no, it's fine. And they were like, here's all these CDs, here's all these books and stuff, go and put them out. And I was oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, 
that's a strange thing to say. I was like, I mean, these look fine. These look great. Like, and they were like, yeah, can you just put them out, please? And I was like, are you sure? But they were like, yeah. So I put them in the bin, obviously. Of course, why would you? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, like, it was so stupid. But like, again it's it's it, you know it's it's a it's a first job thing and everyone has their failures and their, and their vulnerabilities and stuff but yeah anxiety is one of them and sometimes when you get anxious you just like take everything literally because you're just trying not to mess up yeah but fortunately it was as long ago i can kind of laugh about it now i was horrified no, at the time i imagine all it's up with asking the question uh, by putting them out do you mean and then, you know there is yeah. no I mean, there's that saying, isn't there? There's no stupid questions. Of course, there is stupid questions. But if you're not sure, it's better to ask, even if you do make a slight fool of yourself. I bet it wouldn't be as bad as if you put... If you ask that question, it's not as bad as put them in the bin. <laughs> I've not shared that story either. So I've made myself... I've opened myself up to all sorts of ridicule the now. now. There we go. <laughs> um, no, well, look, obviously, you know, learnings from, from both of those, I think definitely resilience, going through an experience... You've, you've been through before there's a lot to take from that and actually on the second one you know taking a taking a step back taking a, a breath trying to look at it from a different perspective on, on a serious note again two things that I've I've certainly had to go through on, on various occasions and um, yeah you learn something different every time don't you so thank you perspective's for, the word for sharing Definitely. that's it yeah Perfect. exactly yeah um, well look main event what are we putting in, John? What 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 can't you stand about marketing? What do you not want to see again? What 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 grinds your gears? So, like most marketers, I love my job, but there are many things that belong in room three hundred one. Many many things. There is many things. We could be here all day, to be honest, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and actually, the thing I settled on, and there's a broader theme here, is returning to AI. AI comments on LinkedIn. Oh my god! Like they are just rampant at the moment. Mm, like, I can't, just, yeah, I have to agree with that. There's just so many like good point or like great to hear. Well, you know, what I've noticed is it's I, I do a lot on LinkedIn. Some good, not some not so good, uh, but I'm trying. Um, but what I've noticed is um, a lot of comments are almost it's almost a regurgitated version of your post, just reiterating what you've said. And it makes no sense and it adds no value. But I guess in the person's commenting eyes, it means they've ticked a box that day and I don't know. But yeah, that's what I've noticed. It's just regurgitated version of what was already there. See that a lot as well. Yeah, it's just like, yes, you're so right. The something, something, yeah. something has yeah, done yeah. the something, something. Like... Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I said it first. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting one because... I think that, I mean, LinkedIn is a fantastic platform, like mm. f- for just networking and just like just talking about everything and anything relating to your job or otherwise. And it's a really, really good platform. But since they've started rolling out like a- AI suggestions or like the um, suggest a post kind of function where it will just like write something for you, the quality has like really, really nosedived. Yeah, I have to admit as well. Like, I- my personal opinion is that LinkedIn haven't got that right. I find no benefit of the AI. You know, you see a post about, I don't know, recruitment or whatever, and, you, and LinkedIn will put, what is what is recruitment? And you're supposed to click it, and it's supposed to give you all this. I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Give me something useful. No, they've got it wrong, in my opinion. But And, and you're right, yeah. There's so much drivel on there now. I mean, I, I'm probably involved in that at some points, but there we go. Uh, we all <laughs> there is, some, there's a lot to of some people. degree, but but yeah, there is. I think it's I think it's really like diluted the quality of discussion online, yes. um, and it's there's something that um, I call it. I don't know if anybody else has called it, but it's almost just like networking at scale. Mm. Um, everybody in marketing, we're all big on doing things at scale, and that's a really important thing. You have to do that, otherwise, you can't you can't just do one offs. But I tell you what commenting and networking at scale is not one of them i think if you want to build relationships with people you've got to be sincere and that's my point here is that i think linkedin and actually a lot of other tools as well is they've sort of like half-assed their kind of ai features where 
all that's happening is people are just being insincere with it. Like if I see something like that, I just immediately just like check out and I've kind of made a judgment that that person can't be bothered to contribute to the conversation. So mm. maybe they're not worth talking to. And I like, yeah. maybe that's, maybe that's just, a, um, you know, judgmental on my part, but I just think that if you're going to say something, have some thought behind it. Mm. Um, especially if you want to build relationships with people, um, in business. I think in a sort of sea of mediocrity um, that those tools are provided, just be brave enough to be different. Yeah. And there is, I think there's going to be a hell of a lot of misuse with AI. I mean, to me and you, it's it's no longer a new thing. Because I think yeah. given what sure. we do for a living, it, it's it's not been and gone, obviously, but it, it's, it's, it's a year, 18 months, and we've been using it. But to the average Joe who's not involved in this and has, has different expertise and skill sets it's, it's new it's just coming in now and they're getting all excited about it and you, you can start you're starting to see the mainstream use of it and and it is poor isn't it that no one mm. there's a lot of people getting their use case wrong and that probably I, I was probably one of those people at the very start it takes it takes a good we'll few have. months yeah. yeah it takes a good few months to realize what role it plays in your own workflow to the where it's actually useful um not useless and I think it's interesting to watch from the sidelines people starting to use it now and the misuse you see. And yeah, it's going to be an interesting few years on the AI front, I think. You see it in a lot of like products though, don't you? Like SaaS products online where yeah. like they've just implemented like just not even a chat bot, just almost like, can I just write this for you or something? And sometimes like, don't get me wrong, like there's definitely a use case for that um, in certain places, but Social media, I'm not sure, is one of them. No. Um, I think it's kind of anti-social, really. Um, no, no. Yeah, it's a weird one, for sure. Yeah. Not I, everything I, needs to have. Not everything needs to have a suggester. Post no, no, definitely feature. not. Definitely not. And I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. To be honest, um, one of the one of the better on, on the topic of AI, one of the better uses of AI I've got is I use like a. Um, it's like a meeting AI. So my Zoom meetings has like a little, a little AI in it that records the meetings. And the tool oh, yeah. that I use is called Otter. It's very, I like it. But it's very good. But they've introduced the chat bar. But it's really good because you can talk. You can ask it questions about the conversation you've just had. So if I'm talking to a sales prospect, I can ask AI, you know, what were the main pain points of that of that particular prospect? And it does return some good stuff. But ultimately, it is just using the Chat GPT API, I believe. But that's yeah. a cool use case. Um, I love Otter. That's, it's brilliant. Really yeah, well. that's worked really well for my own workflow. But again, yeah, the misuse is, is quite funny. So no, that's firmly, yeah, no. AI LinkedIn comments is firmly in th- room 301, my word. Um, anything else to chuck in there? I don't think so, to be fair. Um, I generally... you, cannot come, you cannot get worse than that, though. So yeah. No, that is like <laughs> the pit. Like that's the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that, you know, like I say, I do a, I do a few bits on LinkedIn, and some of my posts that get a bit more engagement. I, I, I can see the ones that have got AI involved. I can see the ones that are actually contributing to the conversation. Is yeah. It's this is the fun. thing. If you're listening, we see you. Like we do see you. <laughs> yeah. And you leave a footprint, and we won't forget it. <laughs> well, look, John, I really appreciate your time. I hope you've enjoyed your time on the Room Three Hundred One podcast. Um, anything you'd like to say before before you leave? Just thank you for having me on, really. It's a great podcast. Um, Really, really grateful to be asked on. So thank you very much. Excellent. No problem at all. Good to to have you on. Um, And thank you all for listening. For those that have listened, uh, please continue to do so. Um, We're looking at doing an episode every two weeks. And I'd like to do an episode every week after that. So keep listening. That's what we might do. So thank you everyone again. Hope to hear from you soon. And we'll speak to you again very, very shortly.